This guitar is a fake, but its righteous tones are real. The only problem is it's impossible to hear and enjoy those righteous tones because it absolutely will not stay in tune. Can we fix it? You'll have to stay tuned. Hey everyone, Miller's Custom Guitars here. Today I've got a really interesting experiment in store for you. In my last video, I started a two-part mini-series that is all about tuning stability. In the first video, I revisited the Duesenberg Less Trem 2 tremolo system, and I took a deeper dive into tuning stability and some easy-to-install hardware upgrades that you can perform to try to increase tuning stability. Now, in that case, uh, we took an already great guitar and we added some great parts and we got some pretty great results. Honestly, going into that video, I basically knew ahead of time what I was going to get. Look, I had some bumps along the way with the extra work that I needed to do with the bridge, but I, I knew before I started that the end result was going to be an awesome guitar that did a pretty good job of staying in tune. This was because I started with a great guitar. I mentioned in my last video that the first ingredient in the recipe for tuning stability is the guitar. And last time I had an A or an A minus to begin with. <laughs> this week, that is not the case. I'm starting with a guitar that's a D minus. Look, don't let the pretty colors fool you. This guitar is rough. What even is it? This guitar belongs to my friend Todd, and it's a certified fake. It says Gibson on the headstock and made in the USA on the back, but this is definitely a cheaply made Chinese knockoff. Now look, there are a lot of people that like to argue on the internet about the moral justification for owning an instrument that is a forgery of a real guitar. And I'm not going to wade into that argument. And you can feel free to do so in the comments if you want. But what I will say is that in this case, the owner of this guitar knew that it was a fake when he bought it. He paid a price that was in line with a Chinese made Les Paul copy, would, what that would cost. And he has no intention of ever selling it. He's not trying to pass this guitar off as the real thing to another buyer, which would be highly unethical. And I think it's maybe even illegal. I, I don't know. Honestly, even if he was going to try to do that, he would never be able to. There are a ton of little details all over this guitar that scream fake, even to the slightly trained eye. The most egregious of which is the nut. It's super cheap plastic, and the nut slot isn't even perpendicular to the fretboard. The nut slot, it's slanted, folks. I I've never even seen that before. The bottom line is that Todd isn't trying to fool anyone. He just wants this guitar to play as good as it looks and sounds. And believe it or not, this guitar, it sounds really good. Despite whatever flaws this guitar has, tone is not one of them. Look, I've never played a three humbucker guitar before I picked this one up. And I never really understood the point. And I could never work out how the controls would, would function. And unsurprisingly, this guitar is wired incorrectly. But, but even so, this guitar very quickly helped me to see the appeal and versatility 
that the added middle pickup provides in this arrangement. So today, I have a simple goal. I want to make this guitar play as great as it looks and sounds. I want the electronics to work right. I want the tremolo system to function smoothly. And I want the guitar to return to pitch when being played. I want this guitar to play great. <laughs> but just because a goal is simple doesn't mean it's going to be easy. To accomplish this goal, we are going to be addressing every playability aspect of this guitar from the end of the headstock to the back strap button. So let's talk about every single thing I did, why that's important, and what it may contribute to the overall tuning stability and or playability of this guitar. So let's start at the headstock. The first thing to do is to add some high quality locking tuners. I installed Godo brand Magnum Lock 3x3 locking tuners with Keystone style keys. I chose these tuners because they have the classic Gibson style look and matched the previous mounting holes without additional drilling. Additionally, Godo has a great reputation for making high quality hardware, so I feel confident that these parts will be a huge improvement over the old stock tuners. Additionally, these tuners have a high 18 to 1 ratio, which is something that the owner specifically requested. These should allow for nice, precise tuning, which is something that this guitar desperately needs. Another thing that people on the internet like to argue about is whether locking tuners even increase tuning stability or just make changing strings quicker. Well, I would like to argue that they do both things. Don't get me wrong. Any well-made tuner will be able to keep your guitar in tune when strung up properly. But I would argue that with locking tuners, it's much easier to install and wind the strings properly than when using traditional tuners. In my opinion, this leads to greater overall tuning stability. Making string changes quicker and easier is just another added benefit. Up next, we get another visit from the String Butler by Dietrich Parts. As I mentioned in my last video, the String Butler helps to alleviate unwanted friction at the nut by fundamentally changing the string pull through angle. It does this by having the strings bend around these free spinning stainless steel bearings uh, and then going straight through the nut. This piece of hardware installs easily in, in less than five minutes with no special tools. And it's a completely reversible upgrade if you decide that you don't like it. Moving on, we have one of the biggest offenders on this guitar, if not the biggest, and that is the nut. The nut slot has been cut improperly at an angle that is not parallel to the frets. Well, why does this even matter? Well, if your nut is out of place, then the notes on your fretboard will be out of tune relative to one another especially on the lower frets of the fretboard. First thing first, we gotta knock out the old nut. I have measured the distance between the first fret and the nut slot on the base and treble side and determined that the base side has the correct measurement. Because of this, I'm going to attempt to make a small hardwood shim and glue it in place with some wood glue. I have a few varieties of exotic hardwood in my wood shop and I'm, I'm going to do my best to choose one that will match the color. I, I choose a small piece of Makassar ebony. I'm going to make sure to, that the glue surface on the neck is nice and flat. And then glue in an oversized shim. I can always cut that shim back if it's too big. But I only want to have to glue in a shim once. So once the shim was glued in, I used a combination of chisels and files and sandpaper. Flush it up to the existing fretboard. Now that that was done, I need to do the most critical part, fixing what they got wrong last time. I used calipers to match the measurement from the base side of the fretboard and transferred that to the treble side. Then I used flexible ruler as a straight edge and uh, striked a line um, using that as a marking knife. Then I used chisels and other things to follow that marking line and cut straight down, basically making a new nut slot that's parallel to the frets this time. 
Now that that's done, that should definitely help my intonation. Once the new nut slot is cut nice and square and parallel and all those things, I needed to install the new nut. The previous nut was a super duper cheap plastic that compounded the tuning problems by causing notes to bind in the slot while tuning or using the tremolo arm. Normally, I would reach for my stock of bone blanks to hand cut a handmade uh, bone nut. However, in this case, we are trying to achieve the smoothest tuning possible. So we are going to use a Tusk XL nut. Tusk is a man-made material that is specifically formulated to have great tonal characteristics and harmonics. Additionally, this one is their XL material, which means that it's impregnated with PTFE, otherwise known as Teflon. This means that it's permanently lubricated, according to their materials, and should help the strings to slide through the nut slot more easily and return to pitch better than ever. It took me a little bit to get the nut height correct and have good action, but now that it's installed, it's all set. Moving on again, I wanted to take a look at the frets of this guitar. And after adjusting the truss rod so that it's nice and flat without any strings installed, I used my fret rocker to see if there were any high frets. One thing we want on this guitar is nice, low action. And if there's fret buzz caused by a high fret, that's really going to create some problems going on. So if I find high frets, I mark them with a permanent pin, and then I can go and file down the high spots either with a file or maybe my Stumac fret kisser. Except for this guitar was in a bad enough shape that I just decided to do an entire fret level using my radius fret, fret block. Afterwards, I recrowned the frets that I filed down, then polished them all, taking care to round and smooth the fret ends. I also cleaned and oiled the fretboard. Doing this will help all the notes ring true and provide a fast and smooth playing experience. One thing I found is that once I was all the way done, there was still one high fret that was hiding out way up here. I had to go back and hit that one again. Up next is the wiring. We're already on the hook here for the cost of several parts. So we're gonna try to save some money here by reusing current electronics rather than replacing them. Look, normally I can't stand those cheap pots that they often put in import guitars, but in this case, we're just gonna let it slide. I will, however, give them a shot in the arm by spraying them with some contact cleaner to help ensure quiet operation. I think that helped out a lot. So I pulled up a wiring diagram from the internet and I followed that in order to correctly wire the three humbucker guitar to vintage wiring specs. According to this diagram, there is a volume for the neck, a volume for the bridge, and then a master tone for the entire guitar. And there's a blend pot for the middle pickup that allows you to add as much or as little of the middle pickup to any pickup combination. This pickup combination should allow for a lot of versatility while still providing all of the tones that we had before. And this is really important as the guitar's owner was adamant that he didn't want to lose any of the tones that he had before. Moving down the guitar, we get to the bridge. This guitar had one of those cheap roller bridges I used to have one like this in the past, and they, they can work well, but in this case, I wanted to swap it out for the bridge from my last video. First off, I, I think those bridges, they, I think they look horrible. Aesthetic appearance is completely based off of personal preference, and I personally, I'm just not a fan. Additionally, on this style of bridge, it just can be difficult to adjust the saddles when setting the intonation. The tunematic design, on the other hand, it's extremely fast and accurate. I think I had this thing intonated in like five minutes. Additionally, this roller bridge is one that I already know is properly serviced and dialed in. I'm going to use the same process that I discussed last time, incorporating a couple wraps of Teflon tape on the bridge pin studs to help make everything rock solid and retaining the paper shims to help reduce the slot between the bridge pin holes and the bridge pins. The last piece of this puzzle is the Bigsby. Or more likely, Bigsby clone. I highly doubt that this is a real licensed Bigsby. I talked about how to set up a Bigsby in my advanced setup video. However, it never hurts to go over some of those points again. 
First off, you need to ensure that the Bixby is installed correctly. And I'm not certain that this one was. Bixby tremolos mount on top of felt washers. In order to protect the finish, and the felt washers on this guitar are non-existent. I was able to buy adhesive-backed felt sheets from Joanne's Fabric in town, and I cut myself new pads. I put new pads anywhere that the tremolo touched the body of the guitar, and then I reinstalled the tremolo. When tightening the mounting screws, you want the tension between the screws to be even so that the vibrato arm can move backwards and forwards and the rollers can spin easily. The metal in these vibratos is it's just cast aluminum. And while it's plenty strong enough to do the job that we're asking it to do, it's not extremely rigid. And if you over tighten the screws or tighten them unevenly, you can actually cause the casting to warp, which will cause the trim to not operate smoothly. In this case, the roller was binding and I needed to loosen one of the mounting screws to allow it to spin more freely. This is what the felt allows you to do by adjusting where the tension is. So lubricate all of the moving parts on your bridge with an appropriate lubricant. I like the TriFlow, which comes with the syringe applicator. You might as well lubricate any other moving parts on the guitar, like the rollers on the bridge and the string butler, never hurts. Last thing to do is to tighten the tremolo arm itself. Use a, a socket or an adjustable wrench to tighten the lock nut on the underside of the tremolo. And, and sometimes there's a little lock washer and it gets pancaked so that it's flat. And sometimes you need to take pliers to open it back up and that will help the nut to stay in place without slipping. And I had to do that on this guitar. Also make sure that the top carriage nut is seated all the way down before tightening and that'll make sure that everything stays put. I said that the last thing was the last thing, but I also said that I would go from the headstock to the strap button. So let's go ahead and check the strap buttons and make sure that they are nice and tight so that there's no problems there. Now, this doesn't affect tuning stability, but it can affect playability. If your guitar is falling off during a gig, we don't want that. Let's tighten those puppies up. So. Now that each of the individual components have been addressed, it's time to move on to the final and most critical stage, restringing and setup. In this case, because I have done so much work on this guitar, I'm gonna put the customer's preferred gauge of strings on the guitar, get it to pitch, get the bridge set to an approximate height for playability, and then play the guitar for five, 10 minutes, allowing the guitar to settle in. After that, I went ahead and I let the guitar sit overnight, allowing it to acclimate to all of the severe changes that we have made to this guitar. This guitar isn't used to having love and attention shown to it. And like a dog rescued from the kennel, it's gonna take some time before it realizes it's safe to be its best self. After it's acclimated overnight, I'm gonna give it a full setup using the train method of guitar setup that I've discussed on my channel before. For a quick refresher though, the first step is to tune the guitar to pitch. Then I set the neck relief to my desired specification. Then I set my action, starting with the nut, then adjusting the bridge, the saddle height. This part is really easy with a tune matic style bridge. You just adjust the bass, adjust the treble with the screws here and it's super easy. Up next is to set the intonation. Use a really good tuner to check the pitch of each string using a harmonic at the 12th fret. Then fret the note at the 12th fret. If the note is flat, the uh, saddle needs to go towards the nut. If the note is sharp, then the saddle needs to go away from the nut. Do this until each note is the same when doing the harmonic and when fretting the 12th fret. The last step is to noodle. Play the guitar and see how it feels. Maybe the guitar can't handle action as low as you thought it could. This one couldn't, I had to raise it up just a little bit. Maybe your nut slots are buzzing a little and need to be backfiled. Maybe your neck needs a little bit more or less relief. Like I mentioned earlier, I found one high fret up here and I had to file it back down, recrown, and repolish that fret. I am now completely done with the repairs, modifications, and upgrades to this guitar. Just one quick note for you. I discussed these items 
in a linear fashion from the headstock to the strap button. I thought this would be a clear way to discuss the work that was done. However, this was definitely not the order in which you would do these repairs, and it was not the order in which I performed these repairs. When doing a major overhaul like this, you need to perform the repairs in a logical order that ensures that you are not having to redo any of the work that you've already done. For example, you would probably want to fix the nut slot first, then work on the frets and the fretboard, then install the nut, making sure it's installed to the proper height. Now that this guitar has had critical hardware upgrades and has been completely serviced, let's check out how much difference that has made. If any, I'm going to do the same test as before. I'm going to start a stopwatch and then start playing. No editing tricks allowed here. I'm going to be in pitch before I start recording, and I will play until I feel like I'm no longer in tune. I'll play with my normal playing style, some soft, some aggressive. I will have some moderate use of the vibrato. I'm really excited to see how this turns out. Let's get started. Okay, I got the guitar in tune. We're going to do a play test. Here is the stopwatch. Okay, and we're just going to play until I feel like we're not in tune anymore. Start on the neck. pickup in. Uh, let's see by itself. So I'll turn off the nick and the bridge. So this is just the middle pickup. <laughs> Pickup in, neck and middle.
Okay, so that was five minutes of constant playing. Um, I, I didn't dive bomb. I feel like Bigsby's are not great at that, no matter how well serviced they are. But I feel like it's in pretty good tune still. <laughs> really quick tune up now to me that's not bad enough that it bothers me if I, i'm sure that when i tune up with the tuner it's going to be out of tune a little bit um but this is a massive improvement over what we had before this guitar before it would take about three or four minutes to tune up and then you would play this guitar thin seconds this guitar would be completely unplayable. And now this is a guitar that you can actually play and rely on. And I think that's that's pretty impressive. Well, I'm gonna tune up real quick. We'll see how far off we were. You know what? I'm gonna do this on screen. I don't know how well you can see that. I'll try to zoom in. My E is in tune. My A is in tune. My D is just a hair sharp. flat my B is in tune okay and the E is gone flat so there you go so I don't know that's pretty impressive you know hey I hope you found this video enjoyable and I hope you learned something either way uh, if you got something out of this video you can show your gratitude by clicking the old subscribe button. You know, all of us people on YouTube always appreciate that. Um, you could also leave a comment and I'm still looking for a catchphrase. Uh, if you have a suggestion, please put that in the uh, comments if you have one. My wife suggested one of my life mottos. So for today, I will put that to here and I will pause it to you. Don't be a jerk. And until next time, don't be a jerk. This has been Miller's Custom Guitars. Hey, Zeke, be quiet, please. Hey, Zeke, hey, Zeke, hey, Zeke, be quiet, please.